Welcome to Wesley Impact. Later on, I'm going to be talking about the upper room after Easter. And we meet a man who had a new lease of life on work, particularly because of one of Wesley Mission's hospital rehabilitation programmes. And as April 7 is World Health Day, we look at the work of one woman whose general practice career started at the behest of the King of Bhutan. At 28, Helen uh, Rienitz wrote to 10 different medical missions and the door opened to her to minister to the poorest of the poor in a land usually closed to the gospel. Helen, it's lovely to have you on the programme. Thank you. Look, you, you say that you, you first wanted to be a doctor as young as 12. Yes, yes, that's when it really came to me. And uh, I guess I wasn't doing that well at school and everybody was amazed, but that was my passion and that drove me for years. I, that's what I, all I've ever wanted to be was a doctor. And then there's a sense in which the Christian faith becomes real to you and that desire continues but becomes expressed in, in a more acute way, doesn't it, for a particular way? Yes, I think at first it was a challenge. I thought maybe God doesn't want me to be a Christian, but then I knew and began to understand that God puts passions in us because he, that's where he wants to take us. And so um, the two grew together. And for me, medical missionary work was then always on the horizon for mm. me. Mm. And what makes you pack your bang go to the other side of the world then? I think I came to a point in my medical training where I could have gone on and specialised in obstetrics and gynae because that's, that's my postgraduate area. Um, but I was suddenly challenged, believe it or not, by reading Job, that God um, cares about the poor. And if Jesus was on this world today as a doctor, he would have gone to them. Mm. And that's what moved me to start looking abroad. Now, look, I was interested to read that, that, um, that, that as your career developed, as it were, you became interested and in developed work with tuberculosis and leprosy uh, control. And um, all of those areas seem to have about them, if you go into a poorer context, the sense of the outcast. I mean, the biblical picture is not really a million miles from the reality, is it, today? No, no, the biblical pictures were very real. And for leprosy patients in particular, there was the sense of the outcast. Um, one of the reasons we were asked into Bhutan uh, as the leprosy mission was because the local doctors wouldn't touch the leprosy patients. Mm. And so we came in actually to do that work and ended up doing general work as well mm. as running the leprosy control program. So how did the, 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 the nine years in Bhutan define you as a person? I look back and say this was my, my growing up experience. Spiritually, I did a huge amount of growing up during that time. Uh, when I look at it, I came little I, little idea of what was going to be in front of me. Uh, had I known how hard it was going to be, I wouldn't have gone. Mm. Uh, but God is good. He doesn't let us see round corners. Mm -hmm. um, and mm. so he, he, yeah, he takes us one step at a time. I did a lot of growing up. Let's leave it at the growing up stage and come back in a moment. I'd like to introduce today's musical guest. Greg Atwell's a worship leader who's passionate about the, the depth and intimacy of Christian music of old. He's added his own flavour to a favourite Christian hymn of so many. Here's Greg singing, I need thee every hour. I'm not 
To commemorate 200 years of faith and pioneering care in Australia, Wesley Mission has released a publication documenting its work in the community. For more information on Today's People, Today's Story, you can contact us on 02-9263-5555 or email us at impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. If you'd like to know more about Greg Atwells and his album, Indie Hymnal, details are going to be on our webpage all this week. Helen, let's return. You not only supported patients, but you, you clearly, uh, uh, working in a mission sense, build up relationships with colleagues and staff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And some of that's an important ministry. That's very important. For most of our staff who are national staff, yeah. who come from either a tantric Buddhist or Hindu background, they haven't seen Christians in action. And for them, they, they're still hesitant about leprosy. I mean, they, uh, you know, it's love in action, loving a leprosy patient. They are, they, they've been unloved and therefore many of them feel unlovable. And it's a really big effort to mm. actually bridge that. And, and the staff see that. Mm. And it made an impact. Staff mm. ask questions. Let me ask you um, about your, your own life. I'm, I'm always bothered when Christians, you know, it's all easy and everything goes well. Some of the struggles in your, your own particular life too. You must have met moments where you've really said, oh gosh, I don't know, to, to add all this up together. Yes, I guess, I mean, there are many challenges and you'd feel very uncertain at many times. And I, I think I constantly wanted God to reassure me. Mm. Um, and God, you know, did. And, and the answers to prayers when we would never know what was going to happen next, when the, each morning we would sit and say, Lord, you know, we've only got rice and dal for lunch today. There's nothing else. It's up to you, God, and we never, ever fail to have something else appear. Mm. Someone would bring in some food or we'd find something on the vines were ripe that we hadn't mm. known about. God just provided every step of the way. You learnt to trust. And then there's the help of the procedures after the wife of a dear colleague died during surgery. Yeah, that was a hard time. Obviously, she died um, uh, having a, a baby, um, uh, in what we call a placenta previa. And that was, that was a traumatic death. Um, and I think it was a few months later when I faced another patient coming in with the same problem. And it was like the same problem in the same setting. And I was terrified, to be mm. honest, underneath. As a doctor, I knew what I should do, but underneath. And in my head, the whole way through the operation, I'm just panic stricken. God, don't leave me. God, don't let her die on the table. God, please don't go away. God, help me. Mm. In my head, that's going round and round. Mm. Um, and while I'm shaking like a leaf, the operation was flawless. Everything mm. went perfectly. And by the end of the operation, I'm starting to calm down. The panic is starting to settle. And I realise that there is a really strong sense of another presence in the room. And God was with standing. you in both times. God was with even me. In, even in the first, which was so difficult. Yes. And that's probably where the challenge comes for the Christian, isn't it, really? That's right. And we sometimes so focus on our own worries and panic that we don't realise that God is there. Now, in 1991, you, you come home at 36, you get married, you've got three beautiful children. How would you define your life now? Uh, I, well, my life now revolves, yes, around family. Um, I'm married to a clergyman, so we've continued to be in ministry in many ways. Um, and I live that Christian, Christian life. To me, that's a very important part of my work. I continue to work as a doctor and as a teacher um, in medicine uh, at, at Wollongong University. Um, but my Christianity is still a very important defining role in who I am and the way I relate to not only patients, but my students mm. and my colleagues as well. And, and a lot of that work with students is about the, um, the bedside manner, the attitudes to people, how you help people through challenges, isn't it, really? That's right. I, um, I teach clinical skills, which is the patient interface. Mm. So I'm trying to teach the students how to talk to and examine patients, which is what I love doing. Mm. And that, to me, means I have one of the best jobs in the world. I get to teach what I love doing. Mm. And I think that comes through. And communication skills are really important for our young doctors. Mm. What does your faith mean to you? It's everything to me. It's the core of my life. It's the whole reason for my existence. Uh, without it, nothing makes much sense in this world. Mm. Uh, and I look at people who don't know that and I think, where is the core? You know, how can you go on day after day without knowing? God is the only thing that makes sense of a lot of the suffering that I see and deal with as a doctor. 
um, and is the purpose for my very existence. That's an interesting comment. God's the only thing that makes sense of that. Now, for many people, they would say, how can you believe in God and? So how, what do you mean by that? Knowing that God is in control, knowing that, knowing, and, under, and it takes a long while to understand, God doesn't want us to suffer. He wants perfection. But this world is a sinful world and we've made a mess of it. Mm. But God stands there loving us through all that mm. and drawing mm. us to him. And sometimes suffering is a siren call mm. to pay attention to him. God's mega, megaphone, That's as right. God's was, megaphone. C.S. Yes. Lewis spoke about after those personal experiences mm. years ago. And, and you've written a book and offer workshops to help people with depression also. Yes, it's something that struck me since I've come back from Bhutan. While the scourge might have been a lot of physical illnesses over there, here our mental struggles, mental health problems with depression and anxiety are very big issues for a lot of my patients. Uh, and I guess it's something that I thought, OK, I've got to come to grips with this. And it's a difficult interface. And my book tries to look at the interface between the spiritual and the medical. Um, for particularly for Christians who suffer these. And why does God allow this hap to happen to me? Mm. And where is God in all this? Uh, and can I be a Christian and be depressed? Mm. Um, and people have been told a lot of fallacies. And I think that's what I've tried to straighten out in my book and give people a chance to think through that as it relates to themselves. Mm. Mm. And, and certainly um, you, you've helped us to see the, the, the relationship between one and the other. Would you say that, that there really there is uh, as much need in Australia as ever there is in a place like Bhutan? Of course there is, everywhere. Um, the devil is alive and well everywhere. Uh, he just he manifests in different ways in different places, but everywhere he's trying to take people away from God and destroy people. Mm -hmm. And everywhere God is trying to show mm -hmm. his love. And um, we just, yeah, it's just a bit different in the way it expresses it. Helen, uh, it's been a delight to talk to you. We shan't forget your, your visit to us and, and, and talking and being... Thank we're you. going to be back in just a moment uh, with more, but thank you for coming and sharing something of the, the intimacy of your calling and and your, your ministry, which is real today. We'll be back right after the short message. It's been 200 years since the first Methodists met in Australia. To celebrate two centuries of faith and pioneering care, CEO and presenter, Reverend Dr. Keith Garner, takes us back to where it all began. But we don't begin here at the heart of London. We begin in a town in the north of England. In this fascinating narrative, Reverend Garner chronicles the history of the life and times of the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. This fresh and thought-provoking documentary takes us on a journey throughout the United Kingdom, beginning in John Wesley's hometown of Epworth. John Wesley was born here on the 17th of June, 1703. This one-hour DVD travels on to his education years and beginnings of social justice in Oxford, to his final years in London. For more information on John Wesley, the man and his mission, call 02 9263 5555 or email us at impacttv at At Wesley Mission, our work through our hospitals also brings healing and wholeness to many. After feeling alienated and alone due to alcohol addiction, Peter's life has been transformed. He's now in training studying nursing in the very place where his own healing began. Let's take a look at this remarkable road to recovery. I was 43 when I decided to, that I wanted help, but it wasn't until like, yeah, got into the program here at Wesley and um, yeah, it really took off. It really became a problem when I was about 23. Once I made the decision, I would drink from morning till night. If possible, I would take holidays to do that. Then there would be periods of where that wouldn't happen. It would just be drinking from afternoon till morning and repeating the process every day. I couldn't go to work. I would keep a bottle of booze beside my bed like a bottle of water. I would just wake up, take a drink, have a smoke, pass out. I had a special connection with this horse. I had him since he was a foal while he was still on his mother and um, we had a special bond developing. It was that special that I could ride him totally blindfolded. He was a stallion and through my drinking, I didn't put him away one night and one of my mares came into season and um, he jumped the fence, tore a big hole in his stomach and he died. 
and I felt it necessary to cover that up. My experience here has been one of growth. It has allowed me to be myself. L life is so fantastic now. Like I'm becoming an AIN, like an assistant in nursing. Hi Sam. Hi Karen. I have Peter with me today who's doing training. Um, would you mind if I explain the blood pressure procedure? Sure. If that's okay? Yeah. I feel I've got something to offer, give people some hope, let them know that there's a choice, that they can make choices now and life doesn't need to be like, uh, like it was for me in addiction and it doesn't need to be like that for them as well. Pete's incredible. His personal growth has been huge to watch and uh, his story is, is full of hope. He's living proof that, you know, Miracles do happen. You know, it, it just starts with the 21 to 28 day program here. That's just the start. The real recovery is in our aftercare. And I think that's where, you know, we are quite different in what we offer. Uh, you know, it's, it's a real miracle to see people get well. This is a journey that, that you don't want to miss. It's a fantastic journey, like the journey of recovery, being in recovery. I recommend it. On the second Sunday of Easter, we find ourselves in the context of the evening of that first day of the week, Easter day, and the disciples were together. And we read about this in John chapter 20, verses 19 through to the end of that chapter, verse 31, which feels like it's almost the end of the chapter. And the disciples, well, they'd had that amazing news that Jesus had been raised from the dead, but they become prisoners in the upper room. Now, you say, well, why were they prisoners? They'd just been told Jesus had been raised from the dead. Well, I think they're huddling together, seeking shelter, because somehow they find themselves unable to understand. Um, and un unable to understand makes you a prisoner. It makes you locked into yourself, locked into the situation. And that is certainly where those disciples were. You see, the disciples couldn't believe their eyes. What they heard as the news, what they had seen uh, in an empty tomb, uh, is really very difficult for them to begin to comprehend. And what you can't believe becomes then a, a struggle to be able to handle. What do I now do? And it's exactly that situation behind locked doors as they find themselves in that upper room. Maybe it's the same upper room where they uh, shared a meal. Who knows? But they're in an upper room locked away and it's in that context that Jesus comes along and announces his very presence by standing among them. I like that, not standing above them, standing among them and he said, peace be with you. Then after what follows is, is, is interesting because he shows his side, uh, um, which it, we're told in John, John's gospel had been pierced and we, he shows his hands where they've been nailed to the cross. But the announcement is certainly an announcement of peace. Now, we know because it's often uh, recorded that Thomas is an important part of this story. Now, he was not with them. Now, we don't know why. This is the kind of story that, uh, that, that we say, I wish I had all the questions that I want to ask. Where was Thomas? But the truth is, he was not there. And uh, uh, Thomas is honest about his situation. Certainly honest about what he is doubting in this particular moment. He says, unless I see the nail prints uh, in his hands when he gets told the news, we've seen the Lord, put my finger in the, where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Um, he's not actually simply saying, I'm going to have doubts about it. He says, I will not believe. And this really is a man who loved Jesus Christ, a man who had worked with him, walked with him, shared the joy, shared the pain. And it's so important to him to know that what he's placing his trust in is something that's real. And a lot of people are critical of Thomas. They say, well, he's, he's full of doubt. Look, he wasn't there. We might have been talking about Peter the doubter. We might have been talking about uh, James the doubter uh, if they had not been there. But we talk about Thomas. 
But you know, what's very important about Thomas is he makes the first confession of the resurrection church. Now, he's given this invitation to place his hands and, and finger in the side and in the hand. But you know, we're not told that he did that. That invitation is given. And he becomes the first confessor of the resurrection church when he says these words, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Now, we too may ask, Jesus, is that really you? There are times in our lives when God reveals himself to us and we, we know something about his presence, but we, we, we can't entrust ourselves to him. Well, in Easter, we, we recognize how important it is to, to make our confession, my Lord and my God, in, in a way that's consistent with what Thomas does. And that confession is going to be such a, 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 an immense change and difference uh, for Thomas and his life. He becomes one of the great early uh, missionaries and martyrs of the Christian church as we recognize how important this is going to be in his life. Um, the disciples recognize Jesus because he stands among them. And the truth is that he offers them peace. Thomas makes his response when Jesus uh, comes uh, to them again a week later, not the same night, a week later, uh, again through doors that are locked, standing among them and says, put your, but he doesn't. He simply confesses, my Lord and my God. He sees in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. He wants to place his trust in him. And not only does he want to do it, he exactly does just that thing as he responds to him. And Jesus told him this, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In a way, that's what we are. And what a wonderful thing it is that Thomas was able to make his confession, my Lord and my God. If you've never done that, Easter season's a good time to confess that he's your Lord, that he's your God, and invite him into your life to make all the difference for our response to that confession will, like in Thomas' case, make all the difference to the way we live our lives. If you would like to know more about today's topic or for more on Keith's message, contact Keith by writing to Wesley Mission, Post Office Box A5555, Sydney South 1235 or email impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. Many thanks for joining us. Here's Judd Field singing Give Your Love Away. Until next week, goodbye and God bless you. Every day I see A reflection of grace In faces of need I know Every time they plead, I know I can see you. You call my name, I can never repay the love that you gave, but now, now I know. you gave